Dear listeners, welcome to Faces of Digital Health, a podcast about digital health and how healthcare systems around the world adopt technology. I'm your host, Tiasha Zaitz, and today you will be tuning into a discussion about the NHS, the nature of change in healthcare, and diversity in healthcare startup investing. U.S. VC funding for female-founded or co-founded companies has been trending up in recent years. However, according to PitchBook, women had it worse during the pandemic. During the first quarter of 2020, 4.3% of VC deals went to companies founded by women, compared to 7.1% during the first quarter of 2019. My guest today is Dr. Fiona Pathiraja, a radiologist by training who left medical practice to become a management consultant. After doing that for a year, she became a clinical advisor at the British Department of Health. She then continued with an MBA and became an investor. Today, she's the founder and managing partner of a two-year-old Krista Gali Ventures Fund. One of the focuses of the fund is to invest in companies led by founders from underrepresented backgrounds. More about that in just a few seconds. Enjoy the discussion and to read the recap of this and other shows, go to www.facesofdigitalhealth.com. If you haven't yet, do subscribe to the show to be notified about new episodes automatically. Coming up next are a few discussions with entrepreneurs from Japan, and much more. Now to investing. Fiona, before becoming an investor, you worked as a radiologist in the NHS. I started noticing a pattern that a lot of entrepreneurs that I know in digital health and our doctors were radiologists. Is there a pattern or do you see a reason for that? It's an interesting observation that you've made that lots of entrepreneurs are are radiologists. And I think that I've definitely noticed radiologists who are moving into entrepreneurship or into investments. Um, but I think lots of doctors are now thinking of medicine plus careers where they're thinking about, you know, can I join a health tech startup? Can I be a management consultant? Can I think of a different management role that I can take? Um, perhaps at a health insurance company, et cetera. Um, with regards to your point specifically about radiology, I think that one of the things that people don't know about radiology is that actually lots of the people there who are drawn to it are drawn to it because of the future and the the fact that they love technology. It's a place which is really high tech, you know, whether it's the hardware that we're using, these amazing machines to do MRIs, PET scans, CTs, um, or interventional radiology procedures, or the software that we're using every day to to do voice dictation or to, to do 3D reconstructions on the images that we're looking at. You know, we love technology and we are in the hospital, the people who are at the really leading edge of uh, technology. So it's not surprising that radiologists are curious about um, tech and therefore the future of health. So they're moving out into the more medicine plus types of careers. Can you talk a little bit about your view of healthcare uh, when you were still working as a doctor? Early on in my career, I became really interested in the bigger picture. And by that, I mean the way that hospitals are managed and run. I started wondering, you know, if I start getting to know the bigger picture, could I have a more meaningful impact on the lives and health of even more people? And really, day to day, I found the interactions with patients really powerful, those one to one interactions. But I started thinking that's only one dimension of healthcare. And actually, um, even in the inside the hospital, there's lots of interactions going on between, you know, doctors and nurses, allied health professionals, managers, executives, etc, logistics staff, etc. But I took some time out of medicine to learn more about the bigger picture. So I was a management consultant for a year. And then I spent a couple of years at the Department of Health, where I worked for Sir Bruce Keogh, who is the NHS medical director. And, you know, through those experiences, I really began to realize, you know, 
healthcare is working in this really complex 3D kind of way by, by which I mean, you know, there's lots of people that when you're in hospital, you don't think about, but they're key players, you know, so whether it's policymakers, economists, um, lobbyists, think tanks, healthcare journalists, there's a huge network of people who are involved in healthcare at all different levels. And that's a much bigger landscape and a much bigger, I guess, environment than what I had in, in health, in, in the hospital, sorry. And so I started thinking, you know, I need to look up from the patient notes and look around and see how I can make a difference in this much bigger landscape, because it's great to be in hospital and have that interaction one-to-one -one with hundreds of patients. But how if I could do something that was different, that could affect thousands of patients or hundreds of thousands of patients? And that's what I really started thinking about. You were a management consultant for a year, and then you worked for a few years as a clinical advisor at the Department of Health. I imagine that that was an additional perspective for you about how healthcare works. What did you learn there about the speed of change and how it could be accelerated? Working outside medicine did teach me a lot about healthcare and the way that, you know, we view young doctors. Um, I think it's a bit sad, actually, that we infantilize young doctors so much. And it's it's a shame because I was, you know, 27 or something when I went off to become a management consultant. And suddenly I was part of a team. I had responsibility. You know, I was giving presentations to clients. Whereas in medicine, it was very much like, you know, you're just the junior. So wait until the registrar or the consultant or somebody else, you know, speaks on your behalf. Um And not just that, obviously there's, it's different because you are in training. However, there is also the real kind of view, I think, that if you infantilize people, they won't step up and, and be their best selves. They won't start taking responsibility in a way that, you know, you might do outside medicine. And I think that that's really important to reflect on. Um, and I think that like the time out of medicine was really for me to gather skills and knowledge and bring them back to, to medicine to try and change it. Um, but over time, I realized that, you know, I, I like to be an agent for change, but I want to see change that happens at a faster pace. And that doesn't happen at the level of policy, you know, at the Department of Health. It doesn't happen at the level um, of the hospital. That real change that's fast pace happens with technology on the outside of the system, of the traditional system. It's happening on the fringes and then it'll diffuse slowly into the system. And over time, I realized, you know, that's where I want, I want to be. Uh, one thing that I wanted to focus in our discussion is uh, to talk about diversity. Uh, Krista Gali Ventures addresses the lack of diversity in health tech and 50% or more of your company's uh, Krista Gali Labs investments are led by founders from underrepresented backgrounds. So let's dive into that. How did you decide to um, pursue this purpose, the discussions about diversity and the need to support the different founders are rising. But what was your uh, kind of thinking behind this focus? Um, well, firstly, because I've got a non-traditional background into investing, right? I'd, I'd spent most of my career since 2006 in healthcare, and most of that was in the NHS seeing patients. So I realized that healthcare is very diverse, you know, both in its leadership. So the doctors that you see are very diverse throughout the organizations, the people you meet, nurses, managers, et cetera, are very diverse. And of course, the patients. And, you know, everywhere you look, there are people from these incredibly different international backgrounds. And the evidence was, this was evident to me on, in a micro way and a macro way every day. And for example, as a radiologist, my ultrasound list could include you know, men and women of different ethnicities, somebody could be a judge, someone could be unemployed, somebody could be a teacher. And every day you'd see this diversity. And then when I started investing, and I started going to my first few meetings, I realized, gosh, you know, investing in healthcare is not diverse. And actually, it was a completely stark difference. Because on both sides of the investor and founder table is predominantly white, straight men. And we do a lot of investments in the deep tech area of healthcare, so AI and machine learning. And this is an area which, you know, if you're working there, really, you need an elite education. Lots of people have got a PhD or they're a postdoc before they came into this uh, startup world in AI. So those from more diverse backgrounds are often excluded from that pathway. 
And I realized that, you know, healthcare needs to be for people from all backgrounds, not just uh, so that means that when we're building solutions in healthcare, so all these great startups are building great solutions, the solutions need to have the patients at the heart of them. So diverse patients. So the solution needs to be include to make sure, for example, simple things that we include patients in the creation or co-creation of AI and digital health tools. We need to make sure that the data sets that we're using are diverse and that they're trying to minimize bias. So you know, do they include women's data sets? Do they include people from back? black and ethnic minorities. So those are the, that's sort of the, the reason I started thinking about this, because there are not many people who look like me in the health tech investing world. And then, of course, I found that it doesn't reflect the wider sort of picture of healthcare. Is it possible to estimate the percentage of the founders that you define as falling into the diversity category. And the reason I'm asking this is because in 2019, uh, female founded companies received only 2.7% of the total capital invested in venture backed businesses in the US. And that's really, that's a very low number, but I think we need to put that into perspective, you know, so it's hard to compare absolute numbers if we don't know what the inputs are. So in short, how often does it happen that you come across founders that fall into the category of underrepresented groups? Just to recap, you know, it, the statistics are showing that it is lacking in diversity on both the found both sides of the table. So in the majority of VC investors are white men. So 87% of partner level venture capitalists in the UK are men. And the majority of founders that receive VC money are all male. And actually, the statistic is very stark that less than one penny in every pound invested goes to all female founding teams. And that's the statistic from the British Business Bank. In terms of how we define diversity, all founders that are currently represented, you know, we want to include diversity in lots of different ranges. So whether it's female founders, those with an LGBT background, those from lower socioeconomic status, people who are black and ethnic minority, that's what, what I'm meaning. And in terms of how many, how often do I see them? You know, I, I see them a lot. The point is, you know, you know, how do we get them from the stage of where you see them early on to then seeing them in the press saying, look, you know, we've raised $50 million for our Series B company. You know, we've exited, you know, and, and we've not, we've now IPO'd. And that thing, that's the point. I see these founders a lot very early on. I really don't see them at all, hardly at all as they move to Series B, C and exit. And where do you see the reasons for that, that they don't get higher? I think it's because, you know, people have, investors have their own unconscious biases. You often, you know, it's, if, if you have an, a very homogenous investor team, you're likely to have unconscious biases and invest in people who look and sound like you. And, you know, for a classic example, I've invested in a company, um, called Juno Bio. It's about the vaginal microbiome. So it's an, it's a company that's, um, working on personalized medicine. And, you know, the founder there is female and, and was told once before going into an investor pitch, you know, don't mention the word vagina. And it's, of course, that then makes things very difficult because you can't really talk. If you can't even talk about what you're you're working on, how are you supposed to get great investment for it? What are your experiences uh, regarding um, the issue of diversity? Did you ever experience discrimination because of your race or gender? One of the the good things about medicine is actually that it is very diverse, you know, and one of the the beauties of it is that there are so many people from so many different ethnic backgrounds. Most of my friends in medicine are gay. Um, lots of the consultants that I worked with in at UCLH, you know, there were strong female role models. There were strong ethnic minority role models, etc. So I never really experienced that, you know, day to day in hospital, which I can only tell you that just talks to sort of the greatness of the NHS and, and, and the greatness of medicine. Um, but in investing, you know, I have come across the odd um, co-investor, for example, you know, who said to me, you know, who is writing the check for you? And I was like, well, you know, I am. And of course, then you can sense that they're very, I guess, you know, perturbed or shocked by that. But it's, I guess it's just, you know, showing up for yourself and 
you know, having a, a strength of character to, to not be very sort of affected and um, negatively impacted by that kind of behavior. But it's still unfair. And that's kind of what I think that the debates today are are kind of addressing. You know, when it comes to women, unfortunately, there's you you can't avoid the different perception of the same behavior exhibited in men or in women. You know, if women are going to be assertive, they're going to be marked as aggressive. If they're going to want to lead, they're going to be seen as bossy. There's a meme circulating in social media. You know, if a woman's going to want to keep telling the truth or just uh, ask hard questions, she's going to be marked as difficult or complicated. So, how do you address that? How do you see the different perception um, between ma male and female founders, for example? Yeah, there is that issue, you know, and I think females in general go one of two ways on that. You either, like me, you know, are very outgoing and can be seen as bossy and, you know, very extrovert, or you are more measured and thoughtful. You're still great, but, you know, you don't go and sort of sell yourself as much. Those both the people might be equal, but I would say to the people who are a little bit quieter and who are female founders, you know, that is a skill as a female founder you need to have because there might be a, a male founder, you know, who is less competent than you, but is very happy to step step up and talk about themselves, and that's a skill that you know female founders need to need to to sort of be comfortable with. You need to be able to sell yourself. You need to be able to step up and um, and be confident. You know, that's actually exactly the topic I was discussing recently with a female founder that was wondering if, you know, if investors look at pitches differently, if a female or a male presents it. What I mean is, do you see that women founders are more cautious less uh, boosty, less uh, confident compared to a male founder. So do you see the differences in the way they pitch or in the way they are confident in saying uh, what they are capable of, regardless of if that's true or not? In terms of pitches, not so much. But I think in terms of achievements, you know, yes. And I think that you know, to a male and female founder could have achieved the same thing. But actually, I think that more often than not, my perception is that the female one will not sort of broadcast it and talk about it as much. They won't sell that point as much. And, you know, I think that's really important because some of our female founders are doing amazing things. Um, uh, Victoria Engelhart, who's uh, one of our female founders, who's founded a company called Kalea in Germany, was just recently the Apple face of Germany and was interviewed by Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple. So, you know, female founders are out there doing great things. We need to champion them and they need to step up and also champion themselves. It's a very difficult uh, topic to to debate because it's not men versus women, but just um, kind of trying to bring in equality. There, a lot of work needs to be done to change kind of the societal perception, even if it's an underlying perception of what women are or what women should be. Because I think that how the environment perceives us is has a great impact on how we are going to feel about our capabilities and how we present ourselves. I wonder, what do you think about regulations or changes such as in November last year, the Germany's coalition government has agreed to a mandatory quota for women on the boards of listed companies? Talking about diversity on boards is, is really important to begin with, regardless of the issue of women, because, you know, the purpose of a board is to provide the best possible guidance you can to the CEO and the management team. And the idea that, you know, a group of homogenous individuals with very similar backgrounds and experiences can do this is, is, you know, absurd. And you really need diversity on boards. Then moving to the health tech point of view, health tech companies need diverse boards as well, not just having lots of people who've previously, you know, who are company builders or who've bought and uh, who've built and sold their own company. You need to, healthcare is this unique, complicated, regulated landscape. And, you know, having um, 
health specific investors and health specific people on your board, in addition to really great company builders and, and business builders is important. Um, and instead of coming back to your point about Germany, I think that measures around what you're talking about, this sort of, um, um, uh, positive bias is not really my personal opinion. I don't think that that's the best way to do it, but it is, if this is what Germany are thinking is a route to creating diversity, then it's definitely worth talking about. And it's worth having that discussion and debate because one good thing is if they're trying to bring up this kind of action, it means that people have realized, you know, it is a problem. We need diversity. We need women on boards. It's the same thing with the issue around the term femtech. You know, I find that a terrible pejorative word and I, I just really don't like it. Um, but I recognize that actually to get the issue out there, it's really important because currently lots of women's products are designed by men, sold by men in hospitals. They're procured by men, evaluated by, um, by, by teams of men. And actually that needs to change because women are 50% of the world. And I think that things like were the word femtech or or your positive bias in Germany are th necessary things that we need to go through before we really do achieve proper equality. As I said, this is a really really difficult and uh, topic to to discuss because you shouldn't have diversity just because of diversity. A few years ago, I was working in a healthcare blockchain startup. And when we were visiting various conferences, there was this whole debate about women in blockchain, you know. So you had conferences and there was always a panel about women in blockchain that was the last thing on the program on the last day, potentially Friday, when nobody was even there anymore. That was kind of a where I felt that perhaps the organizers are only doing that panel to be able to say that they're doing it. What are your experiences in that regard? If we try to look at the issue of diversity or the position of women in leadership positions, to which extent are, are you noticing um the challenges in the way that, uh, that how difficult it is to change the perception and the position that we give to women? Um, I think that there, it's going to take time, as you mentioned, and some of the things around one of the terms that I, I also don't like other than femtech is this term manal, you know, where you have an all male panel um, at a conference. And I actually always call those out whenever I see one. I'm like, you know, actually, why is there another manal? You know, aren't there any other female investors or aren't there any other female founders you can get onto these things? But there is the flip side of it, which actually, you know, they are saying sometimes, you know, we've tried to reach out to a female founder or a female investor, but it hasn't worked out. And we've ended up with this manual now. So it's about, I guess, for organizations and individuals to be aware of these things and to realize you can't always have, um, you know, extreme diversity on every single, you know, event or panel or anything that you do. But it's important that people are aware and sensitive to it. Because, for example, like I, I have... um uh, conversations with, with investors or with startups where people are well, saying sort of the doctor will do X, the doctor will do Y. And then they keep on referring to the doctor as he. And, you know, this happens to me all the time where in radiology startups where they're like the radiologist will do this and they're saying he, he, he. And I will always say actually he or she. It's a simple thing, but you know, language is important and we need to think about the way and be sensitive to the way that we, uh, we discuss that, you know, at a societal level. Uh, before we can also, you know, look into the more micro uh, things around all female panels, all male panels, etc. When talking about bias, I don't want to just uh, focus on the the gender issues in investing, but the, the the bias or the diversity issue is much broader, as you briefly mentioned yourself. You know, so it's not just about men versus women; uh, it's about race, it's about age, even. You know, so how do you uh, assess if? a 50-year-old um, startup founder comes to you compared to someone who's 30 years old? I think it depends on, you know, what, what they're doing. And I see every person because in healthcare, one of the things that's important, the lens that I bring to investing is very much the lens that I bought from the NHS, right? Which is that every patient who comes to see you, regardless of their age, gender, diversity, job, 
wealth, all of these things, you see them as important, you see them for them, and you treat them the best way possible that you can, right? And you don't discriminate, you really make the effort for each person. And so in the same way, I see founders for who they are individually, I'm not thinking, you know, okay, this guy is 23 and the other one was 54. I'm trying to see them for the skill set that they have. And I would say about older founders, I did an interesting podcast on my own podcast, uh, which is called the Health Tech VC with one of my founders called Tom Carell, who founded Sidel Medical, which is in Cambridge, which is the vascular surgery AI startup. And he, I think he's like, I think in his early fifties. And, you know, we talked about the nuance actually that the life experience that you have brings as a founder, because, you know, it makes you more resilient. It makes you um, talk less bullshit for want of a better word. You know, you're, um, you're a sort of more resilient person as an, at an older age than you are at a younger age. So I think that I would say to, in answer to your question, age is definitely part of what we think about, but I try and see every individual for who they are. Are there any specific challenges that you are facing, you know, at the moment as a VC fund? Like, um, you know, we, we tend to see VCs as these almighty figures with uh, power and influence. But at the end of the day, you know, VCs as well as the startup founders need to find, uh, funds for, for the, for their funds. And, um, yeah, managing people and managing startups is not an easy job. Yeah, I mean, finding funds for our fund is not an issue for us because we have a single investor who is able to keep backing us. And we've set us, ourselves up as an evergreen fund, meaning that we reinvest or return back into the fund anyway. Yeah, you know, we talked about biases. One of the things that I've learned th as I go on in, in life and in investing and medicine is to really listen to your to your intuition and to your gut feeling, because I think that sometimes when I've gone against my better nature or get gone against my intuition, it's when I've started to have problems, whether it's with founders or with co-investors, etc. where I've thought to myself, you know, in medicine, when you have a patient, sometimes you can sense actually this, this consultation might be a bit challenging. You know, you can think that before, as soon as a patient walks in, just something in the energy in the room. And actually I've thought that instead, it's the same thing in, in, um, in sort of investing. And in the times where I've ignored that feeling is when things have gone wrong. So really for me, it's about learning to lean into my intuition and to, to sort of really go with that despite, you know, being at an early stage as a fund. That's actually an interesting point because it points out that when it comes to founder investor relationships, these are still, uh, person to person relationships. So it's not that just about the results a found, a founder can exhibit. It's also about some sort of energy that you can sense, um, between the investor and founder because at the end of the day investors do invest for a lot of years as you mentioned before it can be seven or even more years before uh, the company succeeds uh, for the lack of a better world so it's crucial to to find the right partner yes i, w I would agree and you know getting to know people is is, is a very important part of um this world yes do you think it's possible that, for example, if uh, you are a startup founder and you just don't succeed in your pitch because you're just in your early days, that you can come back to the same investor and succeed because investors are busy, you know, you get a lot of pitches uh, on your table. So what's the situation with second chances? I mean, from my own perspective, I think that that's, that's the, it's sort of, that's the essence of life. You know, like what is life if we don't have second chances? And I think that it works on both sides of the table. You know, there might be a situation where a founding team are sort of saying, actually, look, you know, we're not looking for your expertise. We're looking for something slightly different. But then later on, they might come back and say, look, you know, coming up to our seed round or our, our series A, we would really like to have you on board. And I'm not going to look at them sort of badly for that. And I would hope the same way if we've said no at an earlier stage, that if we're re-engaging in those conversations, that people would, you know, be positive and adult about it and, and approach it in a, in a sort of mutually beneficial way. What would your advice be, you know, to, to let's stick to, to women, 
to women and how they approach their startups and the skills that they need to be successful in uh, approaching investors? My advice would be, I guess, would be a bit more general than the whole founders approaching investors. Because as I said, I think that actually in this world of investing, there is a lack of women on both the founder side and on the investor side, right? So I would say you can't be what you don't see. It's something that I say all the time, but it's so important. It's about visible success. If people can't see women succeeding in an industry, then they won't sort of believe that it can be done. They won't invite them onto these panels. They won't think about them as co-investors. They won't think about them, you know, as partnerships for their next product. So for younger women entering the industry, it's about seeking out excellent women to be mentors um, and trying to, you know, convince those people to help sponsor and support them through their journey and to share the tips and tricks that the older or more experienced people have, have learned. And for women who've achieved success, you know, and who are at a later stage in their career, I think it's about making yourself really visible, being available to aspiring women who are at the beginning of their own careers. So I think on that note, like, you, you know, if you're a woman, listen, if you're a woman who's listening to this, a woman in health tech doing something amazing, contact me on Twitter and come and be a best guest on my podcast. You know, the health tech VC, I'm always keen to showcase amazing women and to pay it forwards. And um, I think that's really all I have to say about in terms of advice. You've been listening to Faces of Digital Health. If you enjoyed the show, leave a rating or a review by going to www.lovethepodcast.com slash faces of digital health and you will be redirected to the platform appropriate for your device. Stay tuned. <laughs>